once you get involved in a uh, permaculture project or once you get involved with AMA that I hear from, from all these people, it just opens up so many doors to you. And so uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think you've heard uh, more than enough about my background, but I'd like to go around the room so everybody can introduce themselves briefly and uh, really just uh, uh, tell me what you want to learn about permaculture, why you're here today, what you're interested in. So um, could we start over here? Oh, sure. Uh, good morning. My name is Mahana. Uh, it's an area that I'm really, really excited and interested in, um, especially feeding people in times when um, our sort of food supplies can be so questionable. questionable. And there's a lot of inequity and in, you know how people are receiving food and then how so much medicine is available just through through nature so it's a really important things to me. Good morning my name is oh, no, sorry. Sorry. my name is Yezira. Um, I'm here I'm not a I don't do too many things close to the earth you know, I want to have the knowledge to have an option, and I want to learn it for Amma. And from a selfish point of view, I want to um, show my children what they can do, so the knowledge can be carried forward through generations. Hopefully. My name is Suresh Babu. Um, I'm here because I'm one of the volunteers at the ashram, and uh, in the days and years to come, I hope that you know what I get from you, uh, I can um, translate to helping develop this ashram. My name is uh, Chad Kaimo. I'm with the Alma Center of Michigan. We have a 54 acre property there. We've been trying to do permaculture there for a couple of years, you know, going to classes in San Ramon. So we're very happy to see you this close to Midwest. And want to learn more. dive deeper into the understanding of permaculture, like the specifics and how to apply it logically because I hope to uh, start a management program for somebody in, also in Kenya and also in uh, South Bennington too, and I want to add more specifics. I'm Kate, and um, I first heard about this started it, a friend of mine, two friends of mine that are in permaculture, one of them you might know, Nina, Nina Baki, um, and that's why I'm here today. So, um, I'm just here to carry it forward. I'm Therese, and um, I'm here mostly out of curiosity. Um, I can't say I know very much, I'm ignorant, but I heard about it from her, she's my mom, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious. environmental ethics and ecology in college, and, uh, but it's been a while and I'm really excited to be here and to put some of these, some of this, these ideas into practice. Hey, uh, my name is Beverly, and I'm here twofold. Um, I, when I heard about the program that you're doing, I was very grateful that you were doing this because my daughter's um, purpose in life is to open a self-sustaining organic preschool on a farm somewhere in the universe. <laughs> We're not sure where right now, but she's in school for for preschool, um, learning about kids. And um, when I told her about what they were doing at the ashram, I was 
she was so, I was just talking to her, she was so excited that she wished she could be there. So I, I told her that I was, you know, I, I had asked if it could be recorded so that I could purchase it for her. So she'd have the wisdom to, to pass along to her children. So it's for her and it's also for, um, you know, the generations to come, my grandchildren. I'm trying to teach them about how to be self-sustaining and how, you know, and I'm very ignorant. I know very little. <laughs> I know to recycle things and that's about it. So I'm very excited to learn about this so that I can pass the wisdom along. So I thank you very much for doing this. Sure, I'm Jen. I'm one of the volunteers. I've known Amma for a long time, 25 years. Uh, primary purpose outside of my real job is to do Amma's work. So uh, whatever I, I can do to help out of the ashram with the new center here. And I uh, have absolutely no clue about permaculture. It just fascinated me. Just wanted to come and get an idea so I can help out in any little way that I can in the future because we have so much to do and you know, so many opportunities. The only delving into agriculture in my life was when I was a kid growing up in India. My grandmother used to have a farm. So I did you know, experience a little bit of that because of the living there, going and spending time there. So it's just something that you know, I want to learn more and help out of this way. So thanks for the opportunity. Hi, I'm Milin. I definitely like to eat the organic food, but I had no interest to tell of the organic food. I think so that is why I'm here, so I can generate that interest. And second reason is that, you know, being a resident of the ashram, my boss will come and ask me some question about the permaculture. <laughs> I should have some answer. Who's the boss? <laughs> Amma. <His> boss. <laughs> so that was, you know, you will be translating to <laughs> So I should have some answer, so yeah. that's the reason. You know. okay. and, uh, unfortunately, I have to work remote, so you know, if you need something, you'll have a million come, and you'll ask some question, and so I need to have some answer. That's the only reason. <laughs> I, 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 I have to do work in the future. Yeah, obviously. Okay, Beth? Uh, my name is Beth, and I am going to be the Green Friends Coordinator here at the Ashram. So, and um, I studied environmental engineering and environmental law, and then I started doing some gardening with um, my kids at their elementary school three years ago, organic vegetable gardening which was really enriching for my life. And I'm really, really interested in permaculture, but I don't know anything. So I'm very excited and happy that you're here. And we're going to get started. Thank you. Can we go there to Terrell? I'm Terrell. I'm Terrell, and I live here on the ashram. And, um, I'm an unofficial green friend that is not on paper anywhere. <laughs> I've been studying food for many years now, and, um, chemicals that are in it, and how safe it is now to eat it, and um, I'm very much interested in permaculture and uh, rotating soil and making soil healthy for our crops every year, um, and, and that's all I know about permaculture, <laughs> and um, I'm looking forward to learning more. Hi, I'm Nikali, and I'm here to send the books for the workshop, but really I don't know about anything about permaculture, but I listen and I learn something. <laughs> So Sunil and Rupali, we know them. Maybe can uh, can we ask um, Nirmalan? My name is Nirmalan, and thank you for coming down. I live here at the ashram, and I'm just uh, constantly wanting to learn more of how to live with Mother Earth. Like I grew up in New Jersey. Sorry, I skipped Molly. I have no clue about what permaculture is, so I'm just here to be an official photographer and to learn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lori? Yes. 
going around and doing uh, some introductions. So if you'd like to... There will be a, a couple of opportunities where um, we're going to do activities here in small groups and then also uh, outside we'll do some activities together because uh, I think as far as uh, learning goes, it's best uh, for you, you all to be engaged and active in this uh, workshop and not just be listening to me all the time. But um, I'm going to start out by giving an overview of some of the applications of permaculture and then uh, go into the ethics and the principles of permaculture. Those are really uh, the foundation of permaculture in that uh, all permaculture systems or projects or things are guided or directed by these sets of ethics and principles, which is different than if you think about a lot of people what going around the room, we're talking about food and we're talking about gardening and sustainable agriculture. And those are certainly parts of permaculture, but uh, those are more based on techniques, like no-till gardening, or um, lasagna gardening, or crop rotations. Those are, those are techniques and strategies. They're kind of like how to do something. But permaculture isn't a guide of like how to do something. Permaculture is, is a set of ethics that are directives about how you should think, or how you, what you should be trying to do um, when you're designing how to do something. So it's a little different way of thinking about things. It's more of a, more of a philosophy on uh, sustainable living than it is a technique of how to grow or how to produce um, something. So permaculture uh, comes from uh, permanent agriculture. That's kind of what the word means. was coined by uh, Bill Mollison um, in, the, in the, the late 1970s and early 1980s as, uh, as an integration uh, that's guided by sustainability principles. And there are six big things. Um, it is going to be a challenge to get through a lot of information today. So um, there's going to be a lot of information here, but I'm going to try to condense it into things and uh, I hope that this, uh, this day today will inspire you to study permaculture more and hopefully take uh, a, the full permaculture design course, which is a 72 hour, um, two or three week course that uh, we hope to have here uh, at the center sometime in the coming year. So growing and gathering food are definitely one of the big six things that I, that that I call the six permaculture functions. So uh, I'm just going to write these down. And this is one of those things. Uh, functions. That's, that might seem like a, a funny word, but I just mean that these are things that, that permaculture design systems um, try to provide. You know, that's, that's one, these are some of the outcomes of permaculture. So food is one of the big ones. And uh, I'm going to be showing a lot of pictures from different places that I've worked and, and different gardens that I've grown in. And so um, this is a, a raised bed garden with a, with a little hoop house on it. It was just a square meter garden um, that I started to grow a, a really small kitchen garden right outside of an apartment that I was renting. Um, and this is uh, a garden in Mexico, a uh, multi-story garden growing a lot of vegetables, herbs, and uh, you can see these banana trees here in the background. And this was, uh, we just recently purchased a farm uh, outside of Stevens Point. Uh, we have a 25 acre farm that our, our vision is to turn into a permaculture demonstration and training site. 
uh, but we just moved out of a little one-tenth of an acre urban lot in the city of Stevens Point. That's where we've been living for the last six years. And uh, these were some of the products that we, we planted a lot of fruit trees and berries and, and uh, nuts and things like that and mushrooms in our little tenth of an acre where we were able to grow uh, the majority of our food. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, some examples about intensive urban um, shelter is another one of the six big functions. So, this is going to kind of stretch what a lot of people think of the definition of agriculture. But um, this is a, a picture of our our farmhouse that uh, is actually built into the side of a hill on our farm. So our there's a there's a hill like this, and in our house is dug in to the hill like this. It's kind of a, so our our house has two stories, and uh, the the lower story, the basement, is, is uh, almost completely underground, but it's south facing. So that provides a lot of passive solar benefits. It's insulated by the earth here that keeps the house. Uh, above freezing, even in the, the harsh winter months, um, our house stays above freezing because it's it's heated passively and insulated by the earth. But then uh, the sun, the solar aspect here, especially in the winter months, uh, shines in through um, the windows that you see here, these sliding windows and doors on the south side of our house, which collects a lot of solar radiation and, and warms the house as well. So uh, appropriate climate, appropriate shelter. Um, this is a beautiful hand-built cob house um, that uh, Warren Brush is uh, one, of, one of my mentors, is uh, an expert in, in building with cob with earth materials. Water harvesting, that's another of the six big functions. This is a, a picture that uh, Zach might recognize. This is a, from one of our friend's houses in Kenya that uh, he um, has a, put metal roofs on his two houses and directs the, the runoff into this 1,000 or 10,000 liter tank. Um, so about 2,500 gallons. And that's uh, clean drinking water in a place where most of the water is contaminated and causes a lot of uh, intestinal problems and, and diseases. Um, and that's enough water to provide for quite a large, uh, his extended family for drinking throughout the year, just from uh, capturing the water. So they don't have a well. Uh, they don't have to use electricity to pump the well. So there's a lot of things related to water, water quality and health, and also energy use to, to harness water. And being able to capture water passively like this uh, solves a lot of those problems. Energy is another another big aspect of permaculture. I think energy is actually the key to permaculture. When you talk about sustainability, um, you're talking about creating systems that produce more energy than they use. So that would be like the definition of uh, of uh, yield in permaculture is that you're able to create something that, that is self-maintaining and uh, generates more and more over time than it was required to create. This is a, a, a really neat uh, water harvesting and irrigation system that we use at one of the villages where I work in Kenya. This is a hand dug well that's about 30 feet deep. Um, it's right along the bank of a seasonal riverbed. So these are seasonal rivers that flood during the rainy season and get to be really high and full of water. But then during the dry season, which is the majority of the year, about nine months out of the year is dry season there, um, there's no water at all <coughs> in the riverbed. So they've constructed some check dams along the riverbed. So if this is the riverbed like this, 
they've uh, constructed some, some barrier dams along the riverbed like this where the water, when it flows, it's, it's not meant to stop the water. It's not like a large pond or a, uh, a lake or anything, but it simply slows the water down a little bit and makes it deposit uh, sand and sediment that erodes during these heavy rainfalls. A lot of erosion occurs and comes down into the river and uh, it deposits that there. And that acts like a sponge. And over time, it actually fills up. These are really deep, eroded gullies. So if you were looking at this stream bed, it would be something like this, and there would be water in the bottom of it. But when these, uh, in, these check dams are built, they actually, over time, the level of the soil in, in the riverbed fills up and acts like a sponge that holds water. So the way that this, these uh, small wells are, they're hand dug near the edge of the riverbed. So when the water slows down and sinks in, we're, we're gonna talk a lot about, about water harvesting. Um, you wanna slow, spread, and sink. So you, you wanna keep your water from moving. You want to hold it on your site and keep it in the soil as much as you can. So that's what this does. It keeps the, this acts as a sponge and it recharges this well. It just seeps into this well naturally and in a place where uh, there wouldn't be any water during nine months out of the year, these wells remain uh, full of water now because they're, they're recharged by this uh, sponge happening in the seasonal riverbed. And then you'll, in the picture here, there's a small solar panel uh, with a pump on it. So uh, during the day, every day, it pumps about um, 1,000 gallons of water out of that well that can then be used to irrigate a couple acres of organic vegetables and trees. So um, that's just one example of uh, using renewable energy in a combination of renewable energy and uh, water and earthworks. <coughs> uh, I'm going to call this one waste recycling. This is a, there's a picture of our, of our composting toilet on the left there, which is a really simple thing that uh, we collect all of, our, uh, all of our human waste and compost it, and then uh, use that to, uh, to plant trees. And so um, it's a, it just sort of, uh, it's kind of amazing to think about if you're, if you're eating all this organic food and growing organic gardens, but then you're flushing all of that uh, waste down the toilet into a septic system. It's like all of these nutrients you're creating and all this energy that's coming in is just leaving the system. There's no recycling of that back into your gardens or back onto the land or back into, into your productive systems. Um, and it's also a source of pollution. That's, that's the definition of pollution is, uh, is uh, resources that aren't being used or aren't being taken advantage of. Why do people say don't use human waste for gardening as compost? That would make sense. Like why you know, don't come to your farms and human waste and stuff like that? What's mm -hmm. the thinking in that? Well, if it's not properly composted, so it, it okay. can have uh, pathogens and bacteria and organisms in it that um, if you apply it to your vegetable garden and yeah. then you know the, the soil contaminates the food that you're eating, you're going to cause yourself to get sick or other people to get sick if they eat that and it's not washed off or something. Okay. But if you, if you compost it thoroughly through a thermophilic, a hot composting process, okay. um, all of those okay. bacteria and pathogens will be eliminated. But uh, we, we do this in Kenya as well. <coughs> Kenya, the village where we work, has uh, they have eco-toilets there, mm -hmm. so they recycle the waste. And just to avoid 
even the uh, the controversy over it. Yeah. Um, we use it to plant trees rather than food crops. So you're still using those nutrients to grow trees, mm -hmm. and then you can use the leaves from the trees and and the effects of the trees to benefit the food that you're growing. Mm -hmm. So you can do it indirectly and still have it play a part in your system. And this is a, an example of the beginning of a gray water garden or a banana circle as they call them in the tropics. Um, but this is, uh, there's a shower here inside of this house. And so after they shower, there's a little, a little pipe here where the soapy water, the gray water comes out of their bathroom. And then it pours down, it, it had just been pouring out on the ground into a puddle, not being utilized, so creating uh, waste and uh, also creating great breeding habitat for mosquitoes. And this is a, an area where malaria is a problem. So it was, it was wasting resources and creating another health problem. So this uh, little permaculture garden here solves those things and produces food and compost. So what, what a banana circle is, or a, a gray water garden, is uh, it's just a pit, basically where you, you have a pipe or a channel where your gray water is coming in, and you fill all of this pit area up with organic matter. So it's a compost pile. So all of your food waste, your um, uh, prunings, things from around your house, leaves, grass clippings, things like that, can all go into this area and compost. And so then your, your, your gray water comes in and this the compost, the, the biological process of the decomposition of that organic matter acts as a biofilter. So any types of um, contaminants that would be in your gray water, either biological or chemical or whatever, would be uh, bound up or filtered out by that composting process and by that organic matter. And then it acts again like a sponge, so that water seeps out and you plant fruit trees <coughs> and shrubs and climbing vegetables around the outside of that pit. So you can see um, in this example, in the tropics, there's uh, bananas, uh, sweet potatoes, and other vegetables, tomatoes, onions, things like that. How do you accomplish something like that in a place where it's very, very cold? Having a hole coming, you know, having something come out. Yeah. Of the How would you We're designing our gray water system at, at, our, at our farm. And uh, the way that we're doing it is having a valve in our, in our gray water that comes out of our bathroom. So during the growing season, when gray water can be used to, to grow plants, it doesn't really accomplish much to put water on plants when they're dormant in the winter. So we have a valve that diverts the gray water during the winter into our existing septic system. And then we have a valve that during the growing season, we can open it up and it goes out and irrigates a, a, a series of swales and, and ponds where we have fruit trees. That's our design. Mm -hmm. Is it important you use biodegradable soaps like when you're washing yourself, or is there issues with that? As much as possible, oh, definitely. Yeah. It is not you can yeah, yeah. All right. Good questions. Um, so uh, the last one uh, of the big six permaculture functions is community building. So these are these are the six big functions, and I think that uh, we would all be well on our way to making the world a uh, more sustainable place. If we all planted a garden and uh, we harvested some rainwater, we uh, planted some trees so we could, uh, we could uh, create some energy and save some energy through the effects of trees, and we started recycling our waste um, as much as possible. Those are, those are some really